Your testimony is important and the devil is out to get your testimony so that you would not be effective in your service to Jesus Christ. And ultimately it's going to affect your inheritance, your right to rule with Jesus Christ. All right, let me show you a couple more verses. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. In verse 9, remember, we are told that salvation is not by works, but by grace through faith. But now in verse 10, Paul says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision the flesh made I am sorry I, I just went forward for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained that we should walk in them you see that we are saved by faith alone not works But our inheritance, our right to rule with Jesus Christ, depends on works because God has ordained these good works. These good works for the church and for individual believers to do. He has ordained them before. Uh, it says um, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So the second thing you must keep in mind when it comes to service to Jesus Christ is good works. Good works. And you know what those good works are. You can go and read the Pauline epistles and you will read a lot about them. We don't work to earn our salvation, but once we are saved, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that whatsoever we do, we are called to do it for the Lord Jesus Christ, because again, that depends on whether we are allowed to rule with Christ or not. That, you know, on this depends our right to rule with Jesus Christ. So, Paul says, these good works have been ordained for us to walk in, Every born again Christian, you can think of anything, right? You can think of how you can be generous and charitable, helpful, you know, in so many ways. You can do good things. Now the thing is, a lot of Christians have a motive problem, right? I see, I observe some Christians, well, they're all born again, no doubt about that. They're good people. But when you look at the good works they are engaged in, it looks like they are doing that more to satisfy their own guilty conscience than to please God. Do you know? Uh, I hope you're able to follow what I'm saying. When these Christians do some good things in their lives, it does not look like they are doing that with a good motive. They have ulterior motives there. You must be careful about your heart. Why are you doing those good works? Remember what Paul said, not to please men, not eye service. Not only should you not do eye service to please men, you should not do good works to satisfy your guilty conscience because you feel guilty if you don't do that. It's not that. You love the Lord Jesus Christ. You love his book. You love his words. You want to obey what the Lord has said. Even the good works that we do should be in the spirit. Remember, we are called to walk in the spirit. If we do not walk in the spirit, whatever we do becomes fleshly, carnal. And we do it to please ourselves or to satisfy our conscience or something else. Everything that the Christian does should be in the spirit, walking in the spirit being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, according to the Scriptures. That's very important. And when you do that, you will see that there is joy. There is joy inside you. It doesn't just satisfy a guilty conscience. That's not the design of these good works. 
They are there to glorify God. They are there to be a witness to the unsaved for Jesus Christ. But they are also there to give you joy. Because you have obeyed what God has commanded you to do. You try it out and you will see there is great joy in doing that. Uh, now look at uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. I think I've already mentioned this, but let's just quickly read it. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure the salvation that the Lord has worked into you doesn't remain dormant inside of you. That you work on it and work it out. You need to fear because uh, you know, God wants you to obey. His desire is for you to obey. And if you do not fear the Lord, you do not depart from evil and you do not obey his word. And ultimately you end up losing your inheritance. Right? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm sure you're familiar with this passage. It's very important, so we will read it, even though it's a long passage, slightly long. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. <clears throat> we'll read from 10 to 15. According to the grace of God which was given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation is Jesus Christ, salvation. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work shall be made, made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It's such a clear passage. You don't need Greek or you don't need anybody's help to understand this passage. It's so simple, so clear, so to the point. Paul says, no other foundation can any man lay than that that is laid already. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. He's our salvation, right? He's the beginning of our Christian life. There, on the salvation that he has given us, on that foundation, we begin to build. But Paul gives us a warning. Take heed to how you build. What materials are you going to use to build? Right? He mentions two types of materials. In the first type, he says, there is gold, there is silver, and there are precious stones. Right? Gold, silver, and precious stones. Then there is the second type of material, which is wood, hay, and stubble. These are the two categories into which your works would be divided. All the works that you are called to do today as a born-again Christian. Your work, your service to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, will be looked upon either as gold, silver, and precious stones, or as wood, hay, and stubble. You see, even there, there are different categories, even in the second type. You have wood, hay, stubble, three kinds, just like gold, silver, and precious stones. Right? There we can understand gold, silver, precious stones. But even among those whose works are not up to the mark, God looks at them in various categories. Wood, hay, and stubble. So... Paul goes on to say, every man's work shall be made manifest for that day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And this, of course, I fail to mention it, but I'm sure you know what uh, this passage is about. This is about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is up here in heaven for the church, right? It's for the church. And the rapture we go up to the judgment seat 
of Christ. As some call it the Bhima seat, the judgment seat of Christ. And there your works are judged. Remember that. It's not your salvation for which you are judged. Here at the judgment seat of Christ, it's your works. Only your works. It says in uh, verse 13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Now, many people do not understand this, this truth. They think their salvation is going to be judged. It doesn't say that their works. Some people's work is as gold, silver, precious stones. But there are others whose works are as wood, hay and stubble. These are the two kinds of works. that are judged there at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Your works are judged, not your salvation. Your, you were judged as a sinner here at the cross. Right? This is where you were judged as a sinner when Jesus Christ became sin for us. This is where we were judged as sinners and salvation was given to us. And what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross is total salvation, complete salvation. Alright, so again, some people go so much into spiritual depression because they believe they can lose their salvation that they become ineffective as Christians. They become completely ineffective as Christians. They can never do what God called, uh, has called them to do. They need to understand this. Your sins have been dealt with on the cross, every single one. God is not a liar, right? He said he has given you eternal life, everlasting life. The Bible says you are in Christ. It's, the Bible says you are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. You are a bride, you are a part of the bride of Christ, you are a part of the body of Christ. If you need, you know, if you should lose your salvation, it means somebody has taken a knife and cut a piece out of the body of Jesus Christ, which is not possible to do. Your sins have been dealt with. You're saved forever. But that doesn't mean you've been given a license to do as you please. That's what Christians cannot understand many times. I'm talking about those who believe that a born-again Christian salvation can be lost. They don't see that. At the judgment seat of Christ, what you lose is rewards. Rewards. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Your work will be judged by fire. And the fire shall reveal every man's work of what sort it is. You see that again? What sort. So quality is important. The quality of your work is what God is going to judge, not the quantity. It's not like how many hours you were out there on the road doing something for Jesus Christ. It's not that. What were your motives? Right? Of what sort was your work? What quality was your work made of? That's what is going to be judged there. Then if any man's work abide, which he had built thereon, when the fire burns your works, if it's made of gold, silver and precious stones, your work is going to abide. And what is the result? He shall receive a reward. So here at the judgment seat of Christ, it's all about rewards. Crowns. That's what... Uh, it's all about when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ. Look at verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, that is if it's, his work is made of wood, hay and stubble, it is burned, he shall suffer loss. I want you to notice that. What is that loss that he's talking about? That loss is a loss of reward. It is a loss of your right 
to reign, to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He never said, that, man's is you know, that man is going to burn in the fire. It doesn't say that. His works are burned, but he himself shall be saved. So what we are trying to say is that at the judgment seat of Christ, your service to Jesus Christ is judged. Your works for him are judged. And God is going to see what sort your works are made of. And if they are like gold, silver, precious stones, again, you know, this is a study in itself, the judgment seat of Christ. And these various materials that are mentioned are a study in themselves. We are not getting into that. But I'm just mentioning these, that your work should be like gold, like silver, like precious stones. Your service for Jesus Christ. Now please don't go and say this fellow teaches that as born again Christians, you should not witness or you should not go out and do anything for Jesus Christ. Now, I never said that. I said that's not enough. That's not only what God has called you to do. Whatsoever you do, that's important. Whatever God has called you to do. Now, the reason why I emphasize that a lot is because I know some Christians who out of guilt go out and try to do something for Jesus Christ like giving out tracts or telling somebody, uh, you know, witnessing and things like that. They do it just because they feel guilty in the sense that, you know, uh, they feel that if they don't do that, uh, you know, they are not entitled to whatever, you know, the, the, the comforts they have in this life. Now, it is good. You must go out. You must give out tracts. Tell people about Jesus Christ. In fact, I've made uh, 20 Bible studies on the subject of evangelism and discipleship, and that was only introduction. I have not even actually gotten into the actual stuff there, which I'm hoping I will uh, be able to do in the coming future. So that tells you that I give a lot of importance to evangelism and discipleship. So don't go and say that this fellow doesn't believe in that. No, I'm not saying that. That we have to do anyway. All right. We have to go out, we have to witness, we have to preach the gospel, we have to do all those things. That's not enough. How you live for Jesus Christ, that's important. What manner of service you do to Jesus Christ in the day-to-day -day work that God has called you to do, that's important. Because your service is going to get you the right to rule with Jesus Christ. And if you don't, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose your rewards, your crowns, your right to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't take it lightly. Don't think it's all right. It's not all right. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11. Talking about uh, the labor. He says... In verse 10, of course, it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. In verse 11, Paul says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. In what context is Paul talking about? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In what context? Is he talking about witnessing to unbelievers? No. He says in verse 9, Wherefore we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. What's he talking about again? It's not for salvation. Look at verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. And then he says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So, there would be a reason to be terrorized, terrified at the judgment seat of Christ. There would be a reason for a born-again Christian, for, for a born-again Christian to tremble, to hang his head down in shame, to be gripped with unspeakable fear at the judgment seat of Christ. 
All this charismatic sissy preaching has brainwashed Christians in this Laodicean church age into thinking that Jesus Christ is that meek and lowly Jesus Christ, right? And you have all these Roman Catholic paintings of some uh, European Jesus Christ they have right in those pictures a very handsome man with very gentle features right and his gestures are also peaceful you know one hand I don't know how they do that all those signs that you know he makes with his hand like this I think oh a heart that is bleeding and all that stuff now that is nonsense complete nonsense Throw that into the garbage. That's not our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Now that that, what, that uh, Jesus portrayed by the Roman Catholics is some Hollywood actor. That's who he is. It's not our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not how he looked. A red-haired Jesus, uh, red Jesus Christ. Sorry, that's not how it is in the Bible. He was not like that when he came the first time. He won't look like that when he comes a second time. Yes, there is a difference in how he looks. When you look at him, when he comes back, you know, at, at the second coming, when you look at him, terror fills your heart. That's how he looks, right? You read a description of him in Revelation chapter 1. That's not the meek and lowly Galilean, uh, the, uh, you know, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We don't know him after the flesh anymore. The Bible says, right, his description is his hair is as white as wool, his eyes as burning fire, his body is like, you know, burning brass and all that kind of stuff. He looks terrifying. So don't think it's all about that, that shepherd, you know, that those beautiful pictures of Jesus lifting up a cute little lamb in his hands and all that. That's fine. As long as we are here in this church age, but remember when we stand before him, we're going to stand before a judge, the judge of all the earth, the righteous and just judge. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, Paul says, at the judgment seat of Christ. He's persuading you and me, born again Christians. He says, get your act together. Make sure that your works are right. Knowing the terror of the Lord, I am persuading you, he says. Here at the judgment seat, we need to be careful what we do now. Because we are going to give an account of everything that we do in our body to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, what did I say? 1.18, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 1.18. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at uh, Ephesus, thou knowest very well. He's talking about uh, the house of Onesiphorus. In verse 16, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Look at verse 17. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. He did service to Paul. And Paul says, because he helped me so much, the Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. In that day, we would have need of mercy at the judgment seat of Christ. Just because our salvation is not judged, just because our, our, you know, our, uh, our salvation cannot be lost, does not mean it's going to be like a walk in the park at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not going to be like that. Paul talks about terror in one place. Now he says, I pray that the Lord would grant him mercy on that day. What day is he talking about? That day is clearly a reference to the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. So think about it. Terror could fill your heart at the judgment seat. 
you would need mercy at the judgment seat. That's why it's important what we do now for Jesus Christ. It's very important. Our right to rule with Christ depends on how we serve him today. <coughs> I did not expect uh, to speak so much or rather I did not expect uh, so much of time to elapse uh, by the time I finished this particular point but since we have almost come to the end uh, of uh, this Bible study let me finish with saying a couple more things on this subject of our service to Jesus Christ please turn to the Gospel of Luke the Gospel of Luke chapter 19 and I'm going to read a very lengthy passage Luke chapter 19 and we'll read verses 11 through 27 now you would find a similar passage or a similar parable uh, in Matthew 25 and a lot of born-again Christians make this mistake they think the parable of Matthew 25 and the parable of the pounds as it is called here in uh, uh, Luke chapter 19 are the same they are not the same they're absolutely not the same the parable of the pounds is for the church age whereas the parable uh, that you read about in Matthew 25 uh, the parable in Matthew 25 that's the parable of the talents right it's different you see that the talent the very word talent is for the Jew it's Jewish currency but here in this church age it's the Gentile currency that the Lord is talking about pounds the parable of the pounds now look at this let me read this passage to you and I will say a few things about this passage and as they heard these things this is Luke chapter 19 verses 11 through 27 and as they heard these things he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear he said therefore a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them occupy till I come but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying we will not have this man to reign over us and it came to pass that when he was returned having received the kingdom then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading then came the first saying Lord thy pound hath gained ten pounds and he said unto him well thou good servant because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities and the second came saying Lord thy pound hath gained five pounds and he said likewise to him be thou also over five cities and another came saying Lord behold here is thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin for I feared thee because thou art an austere man thou takest up, uh, takest up that thou laidest not down and reapest that thou didst not sow and he saith unto him out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have had required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he had ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. <coughs> this is very clearly aimed at the Christian in the church age 
this parable of the pounds. Now, I want you to later, if you have the time and if you're interested in really learning the difference, go back and compare the parable of the talents in Matthew 25 with the parable of the pounds in Luke 19. You will see the differences, but I will mention a few very quickly. It says, they were looking for the kingdom of God to appear immediately. The kingdom of God has to do with the church age. All right. The kingdom of God has to do with the church age. Keep that in mind. He said, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Right. Once he finishes his work, he goes to receive his kingdom. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. Ten servants, ten again, is the number of the Gentiles. Is the number of the Gentiles. Noah is the tenth from Adam. Right, the father of the Gentiles, Noah. And uh, the number of the Gentiles is number ten in the Bible. Pounds is Gentile currency. All right, right, English currency to be, but of course, in these last days, England ruled most of the world. So it says that uh, he gave each one of them a pound. But he digresses a little bit in this parable and then talks about the kingdom again. He says, but his citizens hated him. Now you have to see this. The difference between Jews and Gentiles is clearly made here. The Jews and Gentiles. The servants here are the Gentiles, right? The servants to whom he gave the pounds. But the Jews are called citizens. Citizens of the kingdom. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. That's when they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah and crucified him. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him. That's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Right? Jesus Christ went to get his kingdom and he went back. Right after he accomplished his work upon the cross, he went back there and there at the judgment seat, he says, bring the servants. That he might know how much every man had gained by trading. He's looking at their uh, works. How much have they gained by trading? He's looking at their works. And look at this. The first came saying, Lord, thy pound had gained 10 pounds. That means he worked wisely, he put that money, uh, he invested that money wisely, he did something with it so that he profited 10 more pounds through that one pound the Lord had given him. The Lord says to him, note this very carefully, he says, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over 10 cities. So here he says, to one guy who got the 10 pounds, he says, rule over 10 cities. Do you think this is just allegorical, spiritual, sorry, spiritual? I don't believe so. This is literal. Just because Jesus Christ said something in a parable doesn't make it spiritual. When I say spiritual, I mean in contrast to literal. Jesus teaches literal truth through parables. Take for, uh, for example, the parable of the ten virgins. What do you think? He's just giving you a nice sermon with a beautiful illustration? No. He's telling you what's going to happen in the tribulation with the Jews. All right, here he's telling what's going to happen to Christians to whom he has given the commandment, occupy till I come. Right? We have already read that. Then another comes and says to him that his pound had gained him five pounds. And he says, you have authority over five cities. You have authority over five cities. Another fellow said, I have kept up your pound in a napkin. 
because you are an austere man. I was scared of you. I didn't know what you would say of my service. You are someone who, you know, reaps where you do not sow and all that stuff. And what does the Lord say to him? He didn't get anything. He had no works to show Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. He was a lazy Christian. He had just excuses for his laziness. He didn't do anything for Jesus Christ. What does Jesus say? Cast him into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Is that what he said? Absolutely no. See the difference between the parable of talents in Matthew 25 and the parable of pounds in Luke 19. In the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, the unprofitable servant is cast into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here it is not so. His reward is taken away. He doesn't get the right to rule over any cities at all. What does it say? Take away from him what he has and give it to him that has 10 pounds. Give his reward to another man. And then of course he talks about mine enemies which, should, which would not that I should reign over them. Bring hither and slay them before me. That happens at the second advent of Jesus Christ. Read about it in Revelation chapter 19. So please keep this in mind that in the church age, what we do earns us the reward to rule with Christ over cities. Now keep this in mind that this is a limited period of time. Thousand years is a very long time but it's still limited. Right? That's the last millennium of this present earth. At the end of which this earth is burned with fire. Right? You read about it in 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 8, 9, 10 thereabouts. And it says that this earth is burned with fire. Then of course he says... We are looking for a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwell righteousness, right? I do not think that our right to rule with Christ is limited to this thousand years. I think it extends into eternity. The reason I say that is because the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is not limited to the millennial reign. It extends into eternity. Again, of course, you can get into the details which I won't do here, but talk about how this present earth would not be enough in eternity for the population of the earth. There have to be other planets on which the people who multiply uh, would have to go and inhabit, right? They would, they have to be other planets. So there is scope for us, for the whole church, to get cities to rule over. Now, please keep this in mind. The Bible says that uh, New Jerusalem is for the church, right? It's very clear in Revelation chapter 21. The New Jerusalem is called the Bride of the Lamb. It descends out of heaven from God to the earth. And the church is going to be there. New Jerusalem is big enough for the church. When I say church, all born again believers in the church age, right? We already spoke about it in the last Bible study about having a mansion in heavenly Jerusalem. The earth was promised to Abraham and to his seed, correct? So Abraham's seed would populate the earth. But there are going to be Gentiles in the millennium who get saved. And they are also going to multiply. Where will they be accommodated? It has to be on other planets. Now I know all the arguments about whether there are planets or not. Let me just say this. Even if there are no planets, God's going to create them because there's going to be a need for them. All right. So of course, I know God doesn't create anything uh, now, like in the sense of how he created in the beginning. So there must be planets. In fact, the King James Bible uses the word planets, even if it's just once. I think in second Kings, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the people would multiply, just like Adam and Eve would have multiplied if you know, they had uh, not sinned and died. They would have multiplied, they would have had many children, their children would have multiplied. Nobody would die because there would be no sin. 
Nobody would die. So there would be need for more space. The earth would not be enough. But the church, the church doesn't multiply. It's a fixed number. At the rapture, the church ends. No more addition to the church. All the believers who get saved in the tribulation are tribulation saints. They are not church age saints. They are tribulation uh, saints. Whether Jews or Gentiles, they are tribulation saints. They are not part of the church. They are not part of the church. So, the church ends and the church is limited, right? And uh, we can have, we have a scope to rule, not just, I personally do not think that we will be ruling the Jews on the earth, but certainly, because the church is a Gentile bride of Jesus Christ, we will be ruling on behalf of Christ over the Gentiles, over ten cities, five cities or something like that. So if there are about, let's say, 10 billion Christians, each one is given a few cities to rule. Imagine, you need a lot of cities to rule over. That's not going to be just limited to the earth. So that's why I said, I believe that our right to rule is not limited to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, a thousand years. It's going to extend into eternity. Now I know a lot of people would say, oh, this is pure speculation, this is that, this is, uh, there's no proof. There is proof, but I'm not getting into that because that's not really our subject. I'm just mentioning it to you. All right, I'm just mentioning that we are going to reign with Christ, not just in the millennium, but in eternity. As long as Christ rules, the church is going to rule with him. And all that depends on what we do for Jesus Christ today. And that's very important. And that's what I want to foc you know, I want to bring your focus back on that. Maybe till today you have never done anything for Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, you do it selfishly for yourself to please your flesh. Now would be a good time to repent of it. Right? To confess your sin to Jesus Christ. Right now. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. Since the time I've been saved, I've just lived for myself. I've been selfish. Forgive me from now on. Give me a chance. Brethren, the time is... Uh, not very long in this world. First of all, there is no guarantee to life. We don't know how long we are going to live. Even if you're going to live very long, we are very healthy and safe and everything, still, there's not much time left for this earth because the Lord's coming back for the church very soon. Whatever time is left, we should be engaged in serving Jesus Christ. Do your best. I love that old hymn which says, Give of your best to the Master. Give up the strength of your youth, right? Maybe you're not a youth, but still give your strength to Jesus Christ. And then you will see it's going to have a great reward. Here you, will, you may not experience any, you know, any reward. Especially if you're a Bible-believing Christian trying to do something for Jesus Christ. Don't expect to get, uh, you know accolades for your service. People are not going to praise you or they are not going to come and pat you on the back. They are going to criticize you. They are going to call you a heretic because you believe the King James Bible is the pure, unadulterated word of God without error, infallible, inerrant, right? You believe that. They call you a cult uh, mentality. They will say that you are a heretic. Paul was a Bible believer. He was called a heretic. You will be called a heretic. They will criticize you, they will attack you, they will uh, slander you, right? Do all sorts of things. I'm talking about born-again Christians. Other born-again Christians are going to do that to you. Maybe you're going to be all alone, without friends, without fellowship, nothing. Just keep on going for Jesus Christ. Do what he has called you to do. Just keep going. Maybe you don't even have a church to attend to, you know, to attend a Bible-believing church. Maybe there are many churches, all liberal, right, nonsense teaching ch uh, churches, charismatic churches, modernistic churches. You can't have any part there. Maybe you're all alone. Keep doing what the Lord has called you to do. Do not give any place for self-pity. Absolutely do not give place for self-pity. That can destroy your service. 
Don't think, oh, look at me, how sad my condition is. Don't do that. Just keep moving forward. Do what he has called you to do heartily as unto the Lord. With your eyes in the future, look for the reward. How did Jesus endure the pain of the cross? In Hebrews 12, the Bible says, because he looked for the reward in the future. Don't be too spiritual saying, I don't need any reward. I'm going to just do what I'm doing for the Lord. I don't expect anything in return. Let me just read that verse in Hebrews 12 to encourage you and then close this, verse, uh, this Bible study. Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the, the race that is set before us. Now look at this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Don't become weary and faint in your minds. If you keep looking at yourself, that's what's going to happen. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He knew today he's going to be crucified, but he knew he was going to be crowned very soon. And that's what motivated Jesus Christ. Rewards motivated Jesus Christ. Rewards should motivate us. And uh, again, you know, we don't have the time, but let me just say, the Bible says, make sure nobody takes your reward. John says it, right? In the book of Revelation, it is said, let no one take your reward. And you can lose your reward. If your works are not perfect before God. I hope and pray that this Bible study has been a blessing to you. The Lord willing, uh, we will continue studying this. And we will look at the other conditions that the Bible gives us. The conditions we have to keep in order uh, for us to get our right to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much and the Lord bless you.